Welcome everyone. This is the uh, fourth lecture, which is lecture 103 on adiabatic processes. We're going to talk today about reversible adiabatic processes and how they're different than isothermal processes. Now, in an adi adiabatic process, no heat can be exchanged between the system and the surroundings. Where do you get an adiabatic system? In an adiabatic system, whenever you've got really good insulation. <clears throat> now, it doesn't mean because there's no heat that's transferred that there's not a temperature change. There is. Remember, in an adiabatic process, the only thing that happens is heat doesn't move in or out, but the system can certainly do work or it can have work done on it. And that can change the internal energy of the molecules in the system, which means its temperature will change. So let's talk about it. Here's an example, a thermos bottle. Particularly uh, now, it's the thermos bottles that they provide for sale are excellent. I know myself that I've had uh, a thermos bottle that I can put ice water in it, and a day later, it is still ice cold because of the properties of that thermos bottle. They obviously have an almost evacuated layer in the thermos bottle with uh, very few molecules that keep the temperature of that thermos system constant. In all adiabatic processes, Q will always equal zero. No heat is going to be exchanged. We always know delta U is equal to Q plus W, but if Q is zero for adiabatic processes, delta U can simply be equal to W. And we're going to also look at very small incremental changes because it's a reversible process. These very small incremental volume changes will be accompanied by very small incremental temperature changes. So if it's a, a, a adiabatic system and the gas is expanding, the gas can be doing work on the surroundings and the molecules will slow down. And the reverse is true, of course, if we do work on the system, we can compress it. The temperature will go up since no heat can escape. If the work is done by the system, the temperature of the system will go down. Uh, internal energy, U, depends on the temperature for any ideal gas. As we heat up an ideal gas, the particles move faster, the internal energy of the molecules increases. The opposite is true when we cool it. Delta U, as you know, is always equal to Q plus W. So in this case, if it's adiabatic, and the heat Q is zero, delta U is simply equal to work, which can be equal to NCV delta T, or C, where C is the specific heat capacity of this ideal monatomic gas at a constant volume. Why at a constant volume? Because remember, if it's at a constant pressure, then when we have a work done on the system or by the system, the internal energy is going to change since the the volume will change if it's under constant pressure. So we always are going to use NCV delta T to calculate delta U. We've talked about that in previous lectures. N and CV are both constants. So the work for the reversible process is equal to minus P external times delta V. And those External pressure changes are going to be very, very small for every small change in volume that's happening to that system we're talking about. Now, where does the energy come from to do the work if there's no heat? Well, the energy has to come from the molecules themselves. <clears throat> that energy is stored inside those molecules as they move around. The molecules can speed up or slow down. And of course, the internal energy delta U will change accordingly. Uh, the external pressure changes will be very small, as will the changes in volume. We can now generate an equation from this. Basically says the change in internal energy is proportional to the change in the volume. So we have a du equal to minus pressure external times dv. And 
we've already established that NCV delta T is equal to change in the internal energy, which is equal to minus P external times delta V. In this example, we're going to set the external pressure equal to the pressure of the system for this reversible process. Being reversible, it's going to be done in very small steps. Therefore, NCV delta T is equal to minus P dV. Sorry, I should have said dT there. NCV dT equals minus P dV. Or NCV dT equals minus nRT divided by V dV. Where do we get that from? Well, remember, the uh, combined gas law, VP equals nRT. We can rearrange to get P is equal to nRT divided by V by dividing both sides by V. And now we can substitute for P in this equation. So P is equal to nRT divided by V, and that's where the nRT divided by V came from. Continuing. We can integrate the changes to find uh, that quantity from V1 to V2 as those small in, uh, incremental changes happen to volume. And we can now have an equation that says NCV dT equals minus NRT divided by V dV. Now we're gonna, <clears throat> gonna divide both sides by NT. When we divide both sides by NT, we end up with CV, ends cancel, divided by T times DT equals, and again, if we divide it by NT, we get rid of the N, we get rid of the T, we get minus R divided by V dV. Hopefully you can see where we're going with this. So we add up all of those infinitesimal changes together from V1 to V2. And if CV is constant between T1 and T2, CV being the specific heat capacity of this system at a constant volume, we find CV times the integral of T1 to T2 of DT divided by T equals minus R times the integral from V1 to V2 of DV divided by V. So we can recognize these are both inverse relationships and we can use the natural logarithm. One over T, the ln of T2 over T1 times CV is equal to minus R times the ln of V2 divided by V1. Again, the area underneath those curves. Continuing further, since we know A ln B, I'm just going to move this out of the way here. Since we know A times ln B equals the ln of B times A, in this case, A is going to be CV on this side. A is going to be minus R on this side. We can now change this equation using this principle. And we get this new equation. The ln of T2 divided by T1 to the power of CV specific heat capacity, again, of the gas at a constant volume, equals the ln of V1 over V2 to the power of R, R being the combined gas law constant, which we are always given. Remember, if the ln of A equals the ln of B, then A must equal B. So in this case, we have a ln of A, we have equal to ln of B, we can simply make them equal. And of course, on your information sheet, you know the specific heat capacity of a gas at a constant pressure. It's always equal to the specific heat capacity of the gas at a constant volume plus R for a monatomic ideal gas. We rearrange this equation, we get R is really equal to Cp minus Cv, Again, you're always given these quantities. They're on your information sheet. Or if it's for another system other than a monatomic gas, you'll be given those values. So if we substitute for R here, this equation is substituted in for R, we get Cp over Cv. So 
ln of T2 over T1, the power of CV is equal to the ln of V1 divided by V2 to the power of CP minus CV. So let's continue with this equation, see where it takes us. And again, if we know the ln of A equals the ln of B, then A must equal B. We simply are making T2 over T1 to the power of CV equal to V1, V2 to the power of CP minus CV. Hopefully you see that. Continuing. Now we're gonna take the CV to the root of both sides. Why did we do that? Well, think about it when you take the square root of four. You're really taking four and raising it to the power of one half. So we're applying the same principle here, except we're not talking about a square root, we're talking about the CV through this CV. So we're gonna raise both sides to the power of one over CV, like you raise the power of, you raise four to the power of one half to get the square root two. <clears throat> so the CV through is one over CV. On each side, we're going to raise it to that power and we're gonna do some, some math here. So when we do that, one over CV times CV is the same as CV over CV, which is equal to one. On the other side, not quite so simple. One over CV times CP is CP over CV, first term. One over CV times minus CV is minus CV over CV, which is the same as minus one, same quantity on top and bottom. That is going to be equal to V1 divided by V2 to the power of gamma minus one. Where does a gamma come from again? Well, we're going to define gamma. Gamma, in order to simplify this equation, instead of writing in CP over CV, we're going to call it by the Greek letter gamma. So gamma is always equal to CP over CV for monatomic ideal gas. And we're gonna change the equation above to this, because if T2 over T1 equals V1 over V2, then we can cross multiply the numerator of one by the denominator of the other. So you get T2 times V2 equals T1 times V1. And of course the one side is gamma minus one, the other side is gamma minus one. So. <clears throat> Very useful equation. And this, again, I wanna remind you, this only applies to an ideal gas undergoing an adiabatic reversible change. And what's the advantage of this? Previously, when you did uh, problems involving gases, you might have had to have been given five variables to solve for the sixth. Now we only need three variables to solve for the equation. So sometimes we don't know what the temperatures, but we know the pressures and volumes. So if we multiply the equa uh, <clears throat> above equation by the combined gas law, remember the combined gas law, P1 V1 over T1 equals P2 V2 over T2. We can simplify this, T1, is eliminated, T2 is eliminated, and we get P1 V1 times V1 to the power of gamma minus one equals P2 V2 times V2 to the power of gamma minus one. Remember the power of V2 is one, the power of P2 is one, all of them are the power of one except V1 and V2. So we're gonna apply our basic mathematical law that says whenever you multiply two <clears throat> common bases together, you add X and Y. A X, A to the Y is equal to A to the power of X plus Y. So in this case for V, one, one added to gamma minus one simply becomes gamma. The other side, when we add the exponents for V2, we get one plus gamma minus one, one take away one is zero again, we're left with gamma. And that's where this equation comes from. For a monatomic ideal gas. <clears throat> now note that the pressure, volume, and temperature are, are all changing in a reversible adiabatic gaseous process. Whereas in a reversible isothermal change, the temperature is not changing. Fundamental difference. So, here are two new equations that we have just derived. These equations are on your information sheet. You will be able to use them when you solve problems in this course. 
Remember, they're both equal to constants. Gamma is defined as the ratio of the specific heat capacity of a gas under constant pressure divided by the specific heat capacity of the same gas divided by a constant volume. You'll be given this value. And we can use them to find the unknown pressure, volume, or temperature for an adiabatic reversible process. And once we know these values, we can calculate delta H, delta U, heat, and temperature, heat being Q. And again, as I mentioned earlier, when we use the combined gas law, V1, P1 over T1 equals V2, P2 over T2, you need five variables to solve for the sixth. Well, using these equations, you only need three variables to solve for the fourth. So clearly there are advantages to using that equation. I only use that equation whenever I have to. If I'm given enough variables, I will continue to use combined gas law. Continuing on here. So if the process is adiabatic, what do we know? We always know in adiabatic changes by definition, no heat can be transferred in and out of the system because it's insulated so well, no heat loss or heat gain. We always know that delta U is equal to heat plus work. The change in internal energy is due to either heat loss or gain and work done on or by the system. So delta U in this case is equal to W because Q is zero. There's no heat being exchanged. We also know delta U is equal to NCV delta T. We use CV for internal energy because whenever we transfer heat to a gas that is under constant volume, all of the heat energy goes to the molecules in that gas or the atoms in that gas because it can't expand. It's under constant volume. As a lower specific heat capacity than the same gas at a constant pressure because when we apply heat to a gas under constant pressure, what will happen is the gas will expand. So some of the heat energy going in is going to be used to do work to expand the gas. And in this case, we know delta U if it's adiabatic, is equal to work, since Q is equal to zero. We also know delta H is also equal to delta U plus delta PV. And we can calculate the change in pressure volume by P2V2 minus P1V1. But in this case, we can simply use delta H as NCP delta T because there's a temperature change. In an adiabatic process, PV and T are all changing. So if we know the temperature change and we know the specific heat capacity, we can calculate delta H for an adiabatic process. Now let's compare again the reversible isothermal and adiabatic expansions of a gas. So we're going to look at these graphs below. Here they are. One fundamental difference is an adiabatic curve is much steeper. Why? Because there's no heat available to cause the gas to expand. There is only the internal energy of the molecules available. So of course it's going to expand less if it's adiabatic versus isothermal. In an isothermal system, heat from the surroundings can enter the system and make it expand more. So here we have a gas at a certain pressure and its pressure is decreasing and its volume is increasing in both. We've learned previously, we can find the work done by looking at the area underneath the curve. So the area underneath the curve, in this case, is there. It's about 40% of the work required or work available in an isothermal system. So we just derived this equation. To figure out the work, we know P1V1 to the power of gamma equals P2V2 to the power of gamma, gamma being the ratio of CP, CV, specific heat capacities. <clears throat> and PV and T will all change for an adiabatic system. Delta U is equal to Q plus W, but we said that Q is zero in an adiabatic system. So delta U, basically the work 
is done by the molecules, not by adding heat. Let's look at the work done in an isothermal expansion. There it is, the area underneath that curve. We know delta T is zero in an isothermal expansion. What does isothermal mean? It means no change in temperature. Well, if there's no change in temperature, we know delta U is equal to always Q plus W. So we know there is no change in internal energy. Internal energy is a measure of the rate at which molecules are moving around, which is also proportional to temperature. If there's no temperature change, there's no change in internal energy. So we know Q, the amount of heat, is always equal to the work. And they're equal and opposite sign. So the heat added to the system is turned directly into work as the gas expands. There's no internal energy consumed. Whereas when the gas expands in a adiabatic change, that there is no heat available. All the work is being done by the molecules. An isothermal expansion is a much more efficient way of obtaining work than an adiabatic expansion because heat is available, as we've said, from the surroundings. In an adiabatic change, there's no heat available from the surroundings. Let's look at a problem. And before you solve this problem, I would like you to pause the video and do it yourself. Remember, this is, uh, this is a course where you will learn best if you work out the problems on your own. So right now, this particular problem is in your course pack. It's on page 40. There's a space in your course pack, a blank space to solve the problem. Solve the problem in there, and then turn the video back on. Welcome back. Here's a copy of the question. I'm going to show you how to do it. <clears throat> Hopefully, you figured it out on your own. You don't even need to watch this, which is great. But look at the answer to make sure you got the right answer. The answer, I believe, Oh, no, it's not in the course pack. So, yeah, you have to check the at least check the answer. anyway. So key words here. It's an ideal monatomic gas. Very important. It's at an initial temperature of 298 Kelvin, a pressure of 1,013 kilopascals. It's expanded adiabatically and reversibly. Two very important words again. Adiabatically means what? No heat transferred. And it's going to be expanded until the pressure has dropped to 101.3 kilopascals. As the gas expands, its pressure drops. It's gonna be done in small incremental steps because it's reversible. Calculate the final volume and temperature, the internal energy and the enthalpy changes and the work done. Let's do it. Some of the things that you're given on your information sheet for an ideal monatomic gas, specific heat capacity of the gas under constant pressure is five halves R. Specific heat capacity CV is three halves R. CP is always greater than CV because again, the heat energy flowing into a gas at a constant pressure, some of it is used to expand the gas. Whereas in a gas at constant volume, all of the energy goes into the molecules. So it's easier to raise the temperature of a gas at constant volume than it is at constant pressure. And again, specific heat capacity is the amount of energy it takes to raise the temperature of a substance by one degree, Kelvin, or one Kelvin. We always know that CP is equal to Z, CV plus R. You can't use V1, P1, T2 equals V2, P2, T1 since there's not enough data. Let's draw a sketch. We can show that the system is going from state one to state two. The volume is expanding, the pressure is going down. This curve should be a little steeper than an isothermal. Isothermal could be out here. So at step one, at this particular instant in time, we know the volume of the gas, uh, sorry, the number of moles of gas is five moles. Just gonna get rid of that. We know the temperature is 298 Kelvin. No, the pressure is 1,013 kilopascals. We know V1 equals NRT times P1. 
So we can solve for the original volume of this particular gas using V P equals NRT. We rearrange the equation and we substitute our values in for N, five moles, R, 8.313 kilopascal liters per mole Kelvin, T, 298 Kelvin, pressure, 1,013 kilopascals. We cancel out the units and we're left with our volume in liters. Take the simplest method to solve a problem available to you. We know in, at stage two here, the gas has expanded. Its pressure has gone down. We still have the same number of moles of gas, but we don't know its temperature. We know its pressure, but we don't know its volume either. So what are we left with? Previously, you would have just gone, I don't know how to do this question, but we now know because we've been given a couple of additional equations that show the relationship in, in a gas when it's adiabatically changed. <clears throat> we know gamma is CP divided by CV, the ratio of the specific heat capacities of a gas at a constant pressure versus a constant volume. And we always know it's equal to 1.67 for a monatomic ideal gas. <clears throat> if it's not a monatomic ideal gas, we will give you the values. They'll be different. So P1 V1 to the power gamma equals P2 V2 to the power gamma. This is gonna enable us to find a new volume, V2, this volume. So V2 is equal to if we rearrange this equation, V2 to the power gamma is equal to P1 V1 to the power gamma divided by P2. So we can place our values in here that we know. P1 is 1,013 kilopascals. V1 is 12.2 liters. We're going to raise that to the power of 5 thirds. We're going to divide that by P2, which is 101.3 kilopascals. We're going to raise 12.2 to the power of 5 thirds, multiply it by 1,013 kilopascals, divide by 101.3 kilopascals, cancel the units for kilopascals, and we're left with liters. However, that's going to give us V2 to the power of 5 thirds, not V2. How can we find V2? Well, we're going to raise it to the power of 3 fifths, a little mathematical trick. Okay, So we're going to take whatever those numbers work out to be, and we're going to raise them to the power of three-fifths. Doing that, we end up with 48.6 liters. Again, note that three significant digits here, three significant digits here. My answer is three significant digits. Once we know V2, we can find T2. How do we find P2? Using VP equals NRT, an equation familiar to you from high school. So T2 is equal to P2 times V2 divided by NR. When you substitute your numbers in for P2 or V2, which we just calculated, or R, 8.313 kilopascal liters per mole Kelvin, and N, we end up with 119 Kelvin. We're not done yet because we're asked to find the change in internal energy. So delta U, as a result of this, Adiabatic reversible change, what's happened to it? We know it's equal to N C V delta T. We know N is five moles. C V is three halves of R. R is 8.31 joule per mole Kelvin. I'm only using three significant digits because the quantity given to me was three significant digits. The change in temperature was from <clears throat> 119 to 298. And notice that the quantity, does that make sense that it's a negative quantity? Well, if the gas expands and it was expanding at the expense of the molecules moving, the molecules had to be moving slower when we're finished because they did work. So yes, this makes sense. So we divided the number by a thousand simply to express it in terms of kilojoules and do show the number of uh, significant digits. We only want three significant digits. If you left it here, you'd have to write it in scientific notation. Instead of writing it in scientific notation, you can simply write it as 11, minus 11.2 kilojoules. You could have written it as uh, 1.12 times 10 to the power of four 
joules. It's up to you, doesn't matter. They're both the same answer. We can find delta H now. Let me get rid of this. Delta H is NCP delta T. Remember, enthalpy change by definition depends on the specific heat capacity at a constant pressure since enthalpy is always calculated at constant pressures. That's why it's a different C than delta U. So it's NCP delta T, five moles. CP is bigger than CV, it's five halves of R. And then just to save space here on this slide, I kind of cheat a little bit, but anyway, you can see where the numbers are. Multiply by temperature, we end up with a delta H. Again, enthalpy has gone down. Why? Because the gas is expanding. It's done work on the system. Or sorry, the system has done work on the surroundings <laughs> to expand. So delta H, the enthalpy change, is minus 18.6 kilojoules, three significant digits. Now it's vitally important, again, I can't emphasize this enough. The next page in your course pack, page 41, has two problems in it. You need to do those problems on your own, and then you need to look at the solutions in Appendix B. If you don't do that, I can't guarantee your success because it is a participation activity. It's not a spectator sport. So please, I implore you to keep up with the work and to make sure you do all the assigned homework. You do that and you will find this course a breeze. Thank you very much for participating with me and we'll see you later.